So um, let's open up our Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. We are going to actually read from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I hope that you don't mind reading from the Bible. I mean, that's kind of like what you're supposed to do in church, right? We write, read and study the Bible, cling to it. I like to say, if a, if a person's Bible is falling apart, it's a good sign their life is not. Matthew 21, let's start in verse 1. All the scriptures that pertain to the Palm Sunday, we're going to read down through verse 10. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and the, at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when they had come up to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitudes said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Let's turn over to Mark chapter 11. We'll pick up the texts saying very similar things. Mark chapter 11, verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, What are you doing, loosing the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded. So they let them go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the ground. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let's go to Luke now. Luke 19 is where you find parallel passage, triumphal entry. Luke 19 verse 28 is where it is. When he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, and it came to pass when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, or the village that's right here. Where you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it, bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you loosening it? Thus you shall say to him, Because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their clothes, their own clothes on the colt, and they sat Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, 
the stones would immediately cry out. And some of us say, that would have been awesome to see. I wish you had. But now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this year's day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now as you read these texts, we're going to go to John and read the the briefest account there in John chapter 12. You're thinking, I don't see why it's called Palm Sunday. What are you going to find in, in John chapter 12? We finally get to our palms. John chapter 12, verse 12. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees, there they are, and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard he had done this sign. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. So the narrative tells us that Jesus um, comes near the city of Jerusalem and makes some arrangements to deliberately present himself. Now, the, the Jewish calendar would require that if you were able-bodied, you had to come to Jerusalem three times a year for observance of what they call feasts. Um, and they were. They were a feast that was sacrifices involved, and then there would be eating um, and a sort of a barbecue in some ways, and it would be a time when the family would be together uh, focusing on the Lord, uh, looking to fellowship with the Lord, thanking the Lord, but it was also a time of remembering what the Lord had done for the nation, for them, to set them apart in the world as his special people. Uh, The feast at this time is the Feast of Passover. It's actually two feasts at this time, right next to each other. The Feast of Passover would happen one day, and immediately the next day would be followed with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which would last seven days. And so it kind of went under the whole title of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but we just refer to it as the Passover. Um, They would uh, be called to remember what the Lord had done and uh, what the Lord had done in, in this remembrance was that they had set the people free from Egypt. The, the nation was born out of a time of oppression in the, in the nation of Egypt. And, and you know some of Israel's history, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they end up in uh, his, his descendants, uh, about 70, 72 of them end up, end up um, with a, an entrance, a po- very positive entrance into the nation of Egypt because the Lord had done some things through their offspring, Joseph. So they enter in as kind of a special people with a lot of privileges. 430 years go later, uh, later they are no longer in that same position. They have multiplied greatly. The Lord has really blessed their numbers, but they are no longer in a most favored position in the nation of Egypt. In fact, they're the labor force. They're an oppressed labor force. So you know the story. Moses sent to set the, set the people free. You know that. You've watched you know, the Ten Commandments, right? And so uh, the, the Passover rises because it's the, the night they're going to be released. There were 10 plagues. The night of the Passover, when it's, they actually walk out of the nation of Israel as a nation, excuse me, the nation of Egypt as a nation set free, is what they are commemorating. We ought to look at it just a few verses. 
So go back to Exodus chapter 12. Remember, this is the feast that they are required in Jesus' time to commemorate the Passover. Exodus chapter 12, you're probably there ahead of me. Chapter 12, we'll start in verse 1, just read a few verses. We'll skip a few verses. We're not studying the whole thing, but we, are, we ought to take note of some things that are happening at that time because this is the week that Passover happens, and it's going to be fulfilled in Jesus' death and resurrection. So we need to look at these. I'm sure you will later in the week. But it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. Go down to verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or the goats. So, again, they're in an agricultural society uh, at that time. A young, healthy sheep or goat is a huge financial uh, win for a family, right? That's a, that's a financial step forward. You want healthy animals so that your financial and your your it's just your wealth of your family increases, and you get a nice, healthy looking, everything's right, awesome. Well, the Lord is saying, okay, I want one of those as a sacrifice here. We're going to use one of those, he says. Take it from the sheep or the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. They were supposed to bring it into the house on the 10th. That's the original Passover, right? They're in Egypt. Moses has been there working nine plagues by the hand of the Lord upon him, trying to get them out. There's this hardening of his own heart, Pharaoh. He's hardening his heart. The Lord is hardening his heart as he does not respond. We get to this last one, and it says, The whole assembly, middle of verse 6, The whole assembly of the congregation shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat. And they're supposed to roast it, and they're supposed to eat it that night. This would take hours to, to perform, right? A lot of, a lot of run-up to the actual moment of walking out of Egypt. A lot of things had to happen, and they had to, to obey this stuff and hear it and then act in faith on it, right? Go over to verse... And uh, still in Exodus chapter 12, look at verse 22. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. Let's go down to verse 29 now, same chapter, Exodus 12. It came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon. And all the firstborn of the livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt where there was not a house, where there was not one dead. So again, this is the last plague from which the Passover is memorializing in Jesus' time. You know, don't miss the, uh, the unfolding of that event, that original Passover, that night. They, they were called to take a nice, beautiful little lamb, you know. I mean, almost make a great little pet, you'd think. Um, they're cute. They're warm. They're fuzzy. They're not threatening at all. Uh, you bring it into the house. You got it for four days. From the 10th to the 5th to the 14th is actually five days. And then on that fifth day, they're called to kill it. And um, the language there implies that it was kind of a nasty process, right? 
they had to do something rather odd. Um, and they had to kill it in such a manner to gather the blood. Because they had to use that blood in a specific fashion. And, and you, you can put yourself in that position. Uh, you know, I, like I said, I'm from Southern California, in you know, the midst of the urban jungle out there. So I was kind of distant from farms. Uh, food came from the grocery store. And I knew there were farms out there somewhere, but it was like Charlotte's Web, I don't know, cartoon characters. Um, I had an experience, though, uh, you know, we had an agricultural farm at our high school where you could play farmer. And um, I had a stepbrother who did have some animals, and I decided I'd go with him one time to see the animals processed, right? I didn't know what that meant. So I go down there, I'm watching, and wow, it's a, it's a nasty, bloody process. This was no different. Uh, you know, the modern processing benefits from modern techniques and inventions, but not back then. Not back then. They had to take this cute little lamb and slit its throat and do it in such a manner that they could gather the blood. I mean, it's, it's kind of rough language, isn't it? There wasn't any other way to do that. That, that, you know, I'm sure the lamb didn't react positively to that, right? It's not going to be okay. You're going to die. And that thing had to be restrained as they gathered the blood that first night also. And they had to take that blood and apply it to doorposts. Then they had to roast it. They had to eat it. And I don't know if you ever heard how they did that. It would say, it will sound familiar to you. They, they would have... The, the conservative Jewish thought on this is that they were supposed to take a wooden stake and run it down the body cavity of the lamb from its mouth out the rear and then tie its feet to the wooden stake, the rear feet, and then take another wooden stick, wooden piece, running to across that one and tie the front leg. If you're biblically literate at all, you would look at that and say, oh my gosh, that's a picture of crucifixion. So they did not know they were doing that, but then that, that animal would be roasted slowly over the fire until it was edible. Of course, the hair would burn off. It would, it would slowly cook. Again, this was hours and hours and hours before the Exodus. But then the Exodus came, right? The Lord moved through the night. About midnight, he said he would move through the land. And then there would be the difference made. There was either blood on the door or there was not. It didn't matter how you felt about it at that point. Your time for your decision was, was over. And you were either going to be under judgment or you were going to walk out free. That was the Passover. Of course, they left that night. They became the nation of Israel. Their history goes on from there. That's what they're, some 1,500 years later, called to memorialize on Palm Sunday. They're going to go to the city of Jerusalem, gather lambs, sacrifice them. They had they had so many people coming to the city of Jerusalem at these feasts, the population would swell to possibly near a million. And there's no way they had the space for everybody to uh, just casually take their time with the, with the lamb sacrifice. So they had a, you know, they kind of had some assembly lines and some ways of handling that many animals and that much blood and no, that many roasting of the animals. So Jesus and the disciples moved towards the city of Jerusalem to observe this feast. So as he comes to the region of the city of Jerusalem, Jesus does something that you've probably already noticed and that the scriptures highlight. Go back to Matthew 21 with me.
he gets a lamb, excuse me, a lamb. He gets a, he gets a donkey, a young colt, sits on it, goes and specifically requests it that they fetch one from the nearby village. He sits on it. By the way, in the midst of that, you disciples of the Lord will recognize the call of discipleship, right? Verse 6, so the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. If you're following the Lord, you know that that's what a very succinct summary of discipleship is, going and doing what the Lord has said to do. He sits on the, uh, he sits on the lamb, the lamb, the donkey. I'll get my animal straight. Um, he sits on the donkey, and he, the donkey is led into the city of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, and this procession then invokes a reaction from the swelled crowd there. They begin to lay down their garments on the road, fetch branches from around, and make this lush, royal, beautiful road into Jerusalem. And they are acting deliberately on Jesus' own presentation of himself as the Messiah. I don't know if you've you're sensitive to that. You, you ought to note that this is the first time Jesus is allowing himself to be publicly hailed as the Messiah. There's other times in the scriptures and in, the, in the, the Gospels where Jesus is revealing himself as the Messiah to, to individuals. And he usually follows it with some sort of command to be restrained about that knowledge. Don't tell anybody about, about this. And, and this, you should think, why, why would you not? Well, he's got to... He's got it in hand for that to happen, and it isn't yet. John says the same thing, and, and they both reference in uh, the same text. Matthew 21, verse 4 and 5. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. You ought to look at the original prophecy. It's in Zechariah 9. Turn back in the left in your scriptures, in your Bible, to Zechariah 9. It's probably 10 pages, 15 pages. I'm on page 836, if that's helpful. Zechariah 9, 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So his, his presentation of, this, of, of himself that way is a deliberate fulfillment of Scripture. He knows it. The people know it. And they're responding with messianic claims. The son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So that's a, one of the Scriptures that's being fulfilled there, that Jesus is deliberately fulfilling. There's another one in the midst of this. It requires a little more explanation. Jesus seems to refer to it. I think it's more than just seems. Go to Luke chapter 19. In our account that's recorded there, Jesus has an odd reaction to the whole event. And it says, he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. That's in contrast to what seems to be otherwise a very joyous event, right? The, the crowd is swelling with joy and shouts of praise. But Jesus, in a moment, as this unfolds, probably from the top of the Mount of Olives, as he looks over and sees this procession forming, he probably has an initial reaction at this point. He says, somebody hears him say this as he's standing there, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day. It seems to be referring to a prophecy here. The, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Go down to verse 44. He says, and then all these terrible things are going to happen, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now, you and I, if you're working out there, taking what they're given because you're working for a living, uh, you probably have schedules thrown upon you, right? And as you develop your career and go forward, you know, you get more responsibility for schedules. 
and um, maybe you make the schedules uh, and you expect people to keep them. Uh, God's got a schedule, and He's no different. And but you know we struggle sometimes with variables that are out of our control to keep a schedule. God doesn't struggle that way. He keeps his schedules. And so uh, the, the, the central master schedule that Jesus is referring to is found back in Daniel chapter 9. We should go back there. We're not going to do an in-depth study of Daniel chapter 9. You should do an in-depth study of Daniel chapter 9. But Palm Sunday is part of that master schedule. Uh, again, uh, I meet Isaiah and some other construction people out on schedule, uh, out on construction sites quite a bit. And, you know, as the owner signs a contract with a builder, there's always a phrase in the conditions of that contract that says time is of the essence. It's right in the fundamental basics of an agreement. It's no different with the Lord. I mean, he, he is doing these things on a schedule, and he has milestones for us to see, and he does it deliberately. You know, for Jesus to go to the cross doesn't require a Palm Sunday. He doesn't need to do that, right? What does he accomplish by doing Palm Sunday? He, he does it so we can know that he is doing it in God's prophetic overall master schedule, Daniel chapter 9, he says so. Let's read it. So just as we enter into Daniel chapter 9, a little bit of context. Um, Daniel was a young man when his nation was overtorn, overthrown, completely obliterated by the invading Babylonian uh, army. They were kind of the geopolitical power at the time. The Lord gave Jerusalem and Israel into their hand because they had so fallen into idolatry that he just needed to wipe the slate clean and start over. So they got a big fat time out in, in uh, 70 years in Babylon. Daniel was one of the first ones who was taken as a captive, as a young man, probably 12, 13, 14, maybe 15, because he was a young, promising uh, healthy-looking um, youth. He was enrolled in their education system so that his promising, um, you know, his, his future of, of expertise and his knowledge and his training would benefit Babylon. And he now is some, in Daniel chapter 9, some 70 years later. He understands that in God's prophetic timing that was given in the book of Jeremiah, because Daniel's a godly man. He's studying God's word. He sees it. This is 70 years. It's just about over. So he prays. And an angel shows up and gives him this master time schedule. It starts, and we, we we're not going to do an in-depth thing, but we're going to catch a couple of things here. Verse 24 of Daniel chapter 9. Angel speaking to Daniel says, 70 weeks are determined for your people. Okay. So immediately we see a number and a time, 70. We know what the number 70 is in weeks. We may not be familiar with weeks. You and I deal with uh, a base 10 system. We're familiar with 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. We count even blocks of time using that, a decade. They would say the same thing, but they kind of based it on seven. So a week would be seven years, 70 weeks. There's a time, 70 Week. Seven blocks of seven years are determined for, and here's the schedule, for your people and for your holy city. Here's the project. You love project descriptions? You want to know what the schedule is supposed to accomplish? I do. I like that. You ought to if you've got any sort of responsibility at work. What am I supposed to do? Here's what the Lord's going to do to finish the transgression. Now, again, it's worth taking a deep dive on, we're not going to do that today, but the transgression started back in the Garden of Eden. A transgression is where there's a line drawn. You know that's a line. God said so, and you step over it anyway. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. I'm going to finish that transgression. Okay, to make an end of sins, 
There's number two, and you don't have to watch the news very long to think, yeah, the end of sins, man. Let's get this over with to make reconciliation for iniquity. Reconciling, you know, it's a kind of an accounting term. It's to bring things level, bring things nice and square. Everything's even and done. It sounds like salvation, sounds like an atonement. Number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. And if you, again, are sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit and read your Bible, you're like, yeah, let's, do, let's go there. To seal up vision and prophecy, again, another project emphasis here. Everything that the Lord has said is going to happen is going to be completed within this 70 weeks. It's all going to be wrapped up and to anoint the most holy or the most holy place. That means there's going to be a reworking of everything so that it's set aright on earth. That's what that means in a big scale sort of thing. Okay, so that's the project. We still don't know, though, the 70 weeks. We don't know when it starts and when it stops. If we're going to count that down, we need to have a start date, and then we need to start counting days. Right? Keep your projects on schedule. You've got a calendar. You put the big red mark there. Or if you're just, you know, working the hot bar and you got to have the chicken out by 6 o'clock, well, you better meet that. <laughs> so the angel says to Daniel, and again, this is the big, the big picture that Jesus is operating under on Palm Sunday. He says, no, therefore, the angel speaking to Daniel, Hundreds of years ahead of time, know therefore and understand that from, okay, here's our starting point, from, here's our start date for our countdown timer, the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Okay, we got a start date. We can locate that in time. We can start counting. Well, the Bible doesn't leave us wondering or guessing. That's found in Nehemiah chapter 2. And God's got his man in a high cabinet position, in the next world empire that's got the authority over Jerusalem, takes Babylon's place. The Lord's got his man there, and he's moved to go and do that work. And so the Lord works that out. We can identify exactly what date that is. Um, and I'm going to reference here a work that you ought to be familiar with if you want to, again, take a deep dive on these things. I recommend to your Further reading, a book by um, a guy from the late 19th century. His name is Robert Anderson, and he uh, did the math that's involved here. And I'm not going to do it, much as I like math. Uh, I, I'm not going to drag you through that. It's not why you came to church this morning, is to do math problems. Um, so, but he establishes that these start dates are very reliable in history, March 14th, in March 14th, 445 B.C., Nehemiah chapter 2 says that from the royal throne that had authority over the city of Jerusalem, they issued a decree, go build, go rebuild the city. Yeah, we can start counting. And what happens at the end of that time? It says, from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince until Messiah, the one that God is pointing to, who will solve all the problems. <laughs> to kind of sum that up very briefly. Until the Messiah comes will be this. Here we go. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, we don't have time to split those up. Let's just add them together. Two and 16, 60, uh, seven weeks and 62 weeks. 69, and then the street will build, be built again, the wall even in troublesome times. Okay, we need, we need a little bit, of, just a little bit of math here. I'm sorry for it, but you, you ought to know this. The Bible works on a, seems to work on a prophetic calendar of 360 days per year. Not the messy 365 and a quarter, and if you want to get down to minutes and seconds, you can. 
that requires us to put in leap years, and then every, I don't know, it goes from there. It's even messy. The Bible doesn't know that kind of a calendar. It's got 360s. You do all the math here, you come up with 173,880 days. Jesus seems to be referencing this very deliberately as he stands there and looks over the city of Jerusalem and saying, this your day. And he's presenting himself as Messiah, the prince. It was not beyond them to know that day. In fact, he holds them to national accountability that they had missed it. It says there in verse 26, the last little sentence we're going to look at in Daniel 9, after the 62 weeks, remember the 62 came after the 7, so it's 69, 69 times the 7 times the 360, 170, 170,880 days. After that, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Do you have a footnote in your Bible at that point where it says cut off? I do. I like my little footnote there. It says, suffer the death penalty. Okay, let's go back to Luke chapter 19. Again, this is what the meaning of Palm Sunday is. The ultimate meaning of Palm Sunday is, is prophecy fulfilled. And, and I, have you thought about prophecy in its value, I think you should. I think it's I think it's set before us on Palm Sunday. I know that, you know, when I was growing up in a mainline denominational church, it was very liberal, but they still observed Palm Sunday. We would little acolytes, we would run around with a little, little burner, you know, with, with the symbols and the flags, and they passed out the little palms, made it crosses and stuff, and it was completely meaningless to us. At least it was to me. I can't speak for everybody there. God's been giving and fulfilling prophecy for a long time. There must be good reasons for that. And there are. I mean, you go back right to the beginning. Genesis chapter 3, right after the fall, the Lord shows up, begins to speak, begins to make an inquiry, giving people a time to repent and confess, and it's just, you know, blame shifting him, her, I do, not me. When he gets done with all that, he says, he gives prophecies, doesn't he? He says, I will set enmity between your seed and her seed. You will bruise his heel. He will bruise your head. A bruise, that's lovely King James language, is way too soft. The word there means gaping wound. You put that on somebody's head and they're dead. You put that on somebody's heel, well, they're injured. It's a prophecy. Uh, you look at the landscape, major players of the Bible, they all were given prophecies. They all were given statements by the Lord, promises of something that's going to happen in their future. Sometimes it's, it's short term, sometimes it's a little bit longer, sometimes it's very far reaching. There's got to be good reason for that, isn't there? I mean, he does it so much, the value of prophecy. I mean, even Jesus, I mean, a lot, of those, a lot of those prophecies are laid out so that we might identify Jesus and know exactly what he's doing. But Jesus himself also spoke to the value of prophecy. I think we have to look at it for just a minute here. You know, if we, if we try to extract the meaning for Palm Sunday, then we have to recognize that this is fulfilled prophecy and has meaning to me, to you, as we sit here today. You know, if you look at just prophecy, if I, I might use the word eschatology in and out here. I'm kind of using that symbolically, not symbolically, what's the word I'm looking for? Synonym, synonym. You know, anything that the Lord promises you in the future Technically, is eschatological, is the study of something future, right? There's kind of two big banners of eschatology. There's general eschatology. That has to do with 
uh, big things, big movements of nations, of uh, economies, geopolitical events, uh, major movements on an international scale, leaders who have prominence on the world scene and are affecting other countries. That's general prophecy. I think you ought to be, in fact, we're called to be aware of those and to watch those uh, so that we can see and recognize what seasons we are in. And personally, I believe some of the events that are going on right now in our news, you can find them in the scriptures. That's a, that's a study for another time. <laughs> um, so there's general prophecy, but there's also personal eschatology, personal prophecy. That has to do with what's going to happen in yours and my future. Uh, as we sit here, we have plans for the future. We have assumptions of how things are going to go, and, we know, and the Lord adjoins us in that thinking about our future and says, here's what I'm telling you is going to happen in your future. That has tremendous meaning for those who are going to believe his word and lay that word into their own hearts. You know, some of the most basic things that he says, right, that we're all aware of, it is a point and a demand wants to die. And then the judgment. That's personal eschatology. And we know that there's, there's going to be a special generation of believers on the earth who won't have to step over that threshold of natural course of death. There'll be a blessed generation who will be on earth at the time when the Lord decides to unfold another personal bit of eschatology. Titus 2.13, the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Jesus spoke that, right? And his last night, later in this Palm, this Palm Sunday week, he's got that night alone with them, his disciples, and he says, if you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself. That's a direct reference to him promising to take the believers off the world. Certainly it does can also apply to those who are going the normal course. He will come and take you off the world. Now we may be that generation. Every disciple on every age is called to believe that they may be the generation that's suddenly snatched off the earth. We call that the rapture of the church, right? Man, don't go looking for the word rapture in your Bible. You won't find it. What you will find is the word departure, if you know where to look for it. Second Thessalonians 2.3 says that the falling away will come first. That's not the right translation of that word. That word means departure. And if they translate it as departure, then this, it's a slam dunk, clear declaration that the rapture happens first. Unfortunately, some of the translators didn't hold to that view. And so they nudged the meaning over to a secondary meaning of falling away. That's not the primary meaning of that word. But, you know, we all stand there. We look at the power then of personal eschatology. This is what's happening on Palm Sunday. I mean, we ought to, we ought to be people who believe God's word. And so that personal eschatology moves into our understanding of everything. How my life is going to go. You can witness it in the scriptures as Jesus is on the cross. You know, that day's execution schedule was set for a double execution. Uh, we in our culture have gone to great lengths to debate capital um, capital punishment, and the uh, think about it to be uh, avoiding anything cruel and unusual. Not the Romans. They did just the opposite. They wanted to maximize cruelty and unusual demonstrations of it. It was state-sponsored terrorism. 
And they had did it for a reason. They wanted to make it as slow and as painful and humiliating and disgraceful as they could because they wanted to send a message. Don't mess with Rome or this will happen to you. You want this? You don't, then just behave. So that crucifixion was horrible. And they had kind of perfected it. They borrowed it from the, from the, they picked it up from the Persians and perfected it. So the double execution that day got modified. At the last minute, the local Jewish government kind of uh, played some cards they had in a corrupt judicial system and got a third person thrown on the docket. So Jesus is hanging on the cross. And the, the men on the cross, that's their last day. I mean, they got no future, right? There, there are no more family gatherings. There's no more, there's nothing. The end point is upon them. There's lots of mocking going on on the cross as Jesus' enemies are now gloating over his demise. There's kind of a parade of people mocking him and casting aspersions on him. Even those who are being crucified jabber at him. Oh, one of them. He must then begin to think about the things he's heard. He must be reflecting on Jesus, what he's hearing Jesus say. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. And really the verb there is he continuously is saying that. And this bites on his heart. He is convicted as he's hanging on the cross, that criminal. He turns to Jesus and he says, in an in expression of faith, Lord, the guy next to him on the cross, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Uh, he, you know, how much time does he have? That's the best expression of faith that he could muster at the moment as he's dying. And yet, uh, behold the power of personal eschatology as Jesus turns to that man and says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Uh, what is the value of the strength of that statement to that man? on the cross, right then, right there. Personal eschatology had the same value for us. We don't have to wait till crisis, ground zero, to take prophecy to our hearts and see that he's speaking to me, speaking to you. The power and reliability of his promises give us a living hope so we have the promise to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You know, this is the, this is the value of prophecy. Jesus said so when he was on his last night with his, with his disciples. After the Palm Sunday, later on he's got a night where he spends alone with his disciples. In just a couple of hours, maybe an hour, less than an hour, he's going to be arrested, rammed through the kangaroo court, Condemned, right? But he's got that few moments left. And he begins to tell them, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. And he speaks directly to this. Go to John chapter 13. You need to see it. Because though he's speaking immediately short-term personal prophecies that are going to be fulfilled, the way he says it means it's, it's the meaning for all prophecies and why he speaks so many prophecies. So much, so many times he tells us what's going to happen. It's very, very strong. Comes to us with real power. John chapter 13, verse 19. Now I tell you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Okay, now, again, the translators there did a real good job of condensing the original language into nice, friendly, colloquial English. But I'm going to read it to you without sparing words like they tried to do here. Try to trim it down to normal English. 
I'm going to read it to you, and you're going to find it be a lot stronger. When you read it very, very expansively so that the whole meaning of what he's saying is there. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass, in order that you might be believing whenever it comes to pass that I am. disciples of the Lord, we place great emphasis on the word. We're looking to per both personal and general prophecies to tell us where we are, that the Lord has us in hand. It strengthens our faith. And that's, that's the whole reason Jesus is saying he is telling us the future. He says it again. In John chapter 14, verse 29, he says the very same thing. And now I've told you before it comes to pass, that when it does come to pass, you may believe. So what's the meaning of Palm Sunday? We have to get to the end here, don't we? What's the meaning of Palm Sunday? Jesus is going out of his way to orchestrate an event that he didn't need to do. He didn't need to ride a cult into the city of Jerusalem. He didn't need to write those prophecies ahead of time. So why does he do it? So you know who he is. So you and I be absolutely sure who he is. And we have not made a mistake. He wants us to see him. That's why. He wants to draw your faith to himself. He wants you to be fully confident and what he is doing, and why he's doing it. You know, as, as disciples, we should never tire of looking at Jesus and what he's done, what he's continuing to do. You know, Palm Sunday might be very familiar to you from you know, a liturgical calendar at a standpoint. There's a lot of churches today reflecting on it. We need to pull it in personally and say, Jesus is doing this because he's coming in to be my substitute. Have you thought about, have you thought about the power and the reality of the substitute? The whole Passover spoke to that, right? I mean, the Lord said right at the beginning, substitutions were, were, were acceptable. Adam and Eve were supposed to die in that garden. Who died, though? An animal, a substitute. Later on, the whole tabernacle, the temple, the, 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 the remembrances and the rituals of the, the Passover and the sacrifices, they were all showing over and over again that a substitute was okay. Now, an animal doesn't, doesn't quite match up in substitution value that's needed, right? I mean, an animal is valuable, an animal is innocent, and so as that animal is kind of brought forward and sacrificed, for me, I can identify with it, but it isn't quite reconciled completely, is it? There's just not a one-to-one -one correlation. So if I'm going to have a substitute, if you're going to have a substitute, you've got to find a human. God's not into human sacrifice, but we need one. Because, because remember that prophecy we read, Zechariah? It says, he is just and having salvation. And that's a problem. I don't know if you thought about ever God having a problem. Because he wants to be, and he has to be, and he will be completely just with sin. Everything that is offensive, a crime against, crosses the intents and purposes of what God created, will be judged. He will execute perfect judgment and justice. But he's stuck, right? Because he, he, he doesn't want to judge you and I. So he's stuck. How, did, how does he work that out? Well, he solved it with the Passover lamb. He could be just 
and have salvation. That substitute that's in your place, he speaks to us about his nature also. Because that human that's going to stand in our position has to be sinless. He can't pay for his own sin. That's not equivalent. He's got his own sin to pay for. He can't stand in my place. So we need a sinless human. And if it's going to be equivalent, he's got to, he's got to know what he's stepping into. Think about the wrath of God that your sin deserves. I mean, maybe you don't understand the full extent of how we have fallen short of the glory of God. But it's, it's worth something, isn't it? I mean, I don't want to be in that place. And yet, don't we see the heart of God? Because as he steps into that place, he does so willingly. How many motivations can you come up with to do that? Just one. He loves you. So, what is the meaning of Palm Sunday? It's God allowing himself to be put into your place, into my place, to be our substitute, out of love. He does in such a manner that you cannot mistake his coming. He calls you to believe it, He calls you to witness it. He calls you to see those prophecies fulfilled. Have your faith in him strengthened. And we look at those other personal prophecies and we see, okay, I can trust you. I can go forward with you. He's already filled these prophecies so literally and so faithfully. He's going to do what he has said he's going to do. You know, he said that. He said, you may continue to believe that I am. We need strong faith in these days. Let's let Palm Sunday this year be that thing that strengthens our faith. Man, the the wheels are falling off. The world is going bananas. If there's anything the last couple of years have taught you is that we need the Lord to return. What are we doing day by day? We're waiting for the Lord to return. He has promised he will. He will. He's already fulfilled his word to be our substitute. Palm Sunday is that. I hope that Palm Sunday this year is a cause for your faith to be strengthened. Strengthened so that you can go forward with him. If you have not taken Jesus at his word to be your substitute, let this Palm Sunday be the year that you do that. You let him be your Passover lamb that takes away your sin. If that's you and you want to, you want to have a, somebody to pray with, talk to somebody about that, I'll be in the back. There'll be other people, maybe the people you came with. They can be more than happy to pray with you, to talk to you about the decision you need to make. Let's finish there. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being our substitute. Thank you for drawing near to the city of Jerusalem, letting us identify you so clearly, so plainly. Thank you for the strength of your promises. Thank you for speaking to us personally about our future and the hope, the living hope that you have offered to each one of us. We love you, Lord. Call us forward to follow you this week. Fill us with your spirit for these things. We pray in your name. Amen.